former board members who now lives in Innsbruck, Austria, and Rolf Stomp, uh, who's coming to us from Germany today. Uh, Rolf and I actually got to meet in person last uh, May, chasing the big boy out in in Utah. That was uh, that was a lot of fun, and uh, I think a little bit uh, better better spring than we had this year. But hopefully, we'll uh, we'll get through this and be out trackside again soon. So, uh, let's see. Looks like Haley's got the uh, recording going, so we're we're good to go. Bob, take it away. Okay, thanks, Scott, and, and welcome, Michael, and welcome, Rolf. Rolf and I were emailing the other day, Scott, about uh, that, uh, that I think you said you might have met at Peterson, you know, on the road above the railroad tracks. And of course, exactly. I, I was below a track side, so I'm probably in your photos. <laughs> yeah, you and, you and just a couple of other people. <laughs> <laughs> so, although I'm you were far enough away that I probably didn't show up at all. But um, in any event, um, this will be a really interesting presentation as well. A purpose from India uh, in the last hour. Uh, Rolf Stump of um, uh, Germany uh, is going to present uh, with Mike Valentine, who was in Innsbruck, uh, Austria. Um, Rolf is from Firth, Bavaria, to be more specific. And uh, I'm really looking forward to their then and now in uh, European uh, photography. And Rolf will look at the then uh, photography of Eastern and West Germany of the 70s and 1980s through the travels he made there before the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, as well as some photography that he made in North America, Greece, uh, and Portugal. And then part two, uh, Mike will look at more recent uh, photography of European railways. So looking forward to that. And some of the things I've seen from both of you on Facebook have been fantastic. Uh, I've known Mike for a long time. Uh, we've been, we're on the center board together, Facebook friends and all that good stuff. And uh, uh, I would, I, even I was surprised to learn in bio that he's had over 200 images published in Trains Magazine and other periodicals and books and so forth and so on. That's a uh, spectacular a tribute to his, his uh, prowess uh, behind the camera. Um, he's, uh, I'd say, semi-retired right now but um, spent many years in Michigan uh, uh, with uh, Leone Engineering, uh, which deals with advanced robotics for the auto industry. And so there's advanced robotics on one side and then narrow gauge steam in Colorado <laughs> on the other. So quite, that's a sort of te techno technological changes for Michael. And uh, one of the things that impressed me about him was uh, the, the reconstruction, remodeling, and uh, rest restoration of your home in Michigan, which you, I think, did actually personally. And as a great <laughs> project, it was highly documented on Facebook. And then once it got completed, you moved to Innsbruck, Austria, which I thought was astounding. <laughs> oh, um, so we really enjoyed um, getting to know Mike over the many years, and he was a, a great contributor to the center board until he moved to Austria. Then uh, Rolf uh, has uh, uh, first gained an interest in railroads from a busy junction uh, that uh, near his grandparents' house were regular team operated until 1976 and uh, got behind a camera in 1984 and focused on steam and brake lines. Uh, and then turned to you know greater pursuits uh, around Europe and North America. He's had two books published, uh, has a degree in engineering, geology, and has hosted a series of um, ma magazines uh, on North American railroading and so forth and so on. Um, I think, Rolf, I, I'm really looking forward to your documentary, but one of the things that he said, you know, well, Mike might be retired from work. He's now retired from rail fanning and is working, has been for several years in his wife's business which is a men's clothing store that's uh, off and running. And obviously there's stress and strains today as related, related to COVID, but uh, his work has uh, been spectacular. So why don't I turn it over to the two of you and we can get started. Thank you very much, Bon. Okay, then I, th I think I'm now the presenter of the part of our presentation. Um, mm -hmm. As Don said, 
Um, my interest my interest in railways started in this uh, nice uh, little but busy junction station in uh, the center of uh, Germany. It's in West Germany, and the, the, the little guy in the, with the blonde, full blonde hair, that's me in 1973, uh, marveling at the tracks, but my father uh, didn't wait for a train to pass, because uh, in 1973, steam was uh, still out and about there, and um, yeah, this left an impact with me, because uh, in this valley, the sound was fantastic, and from the balcony of my grandfather's house on the hill, uh, I could... Uh, look down on the, um, the semaphore signals you see in the distance. They are standing on the bridge. And I could look right down on the bridge, and if the semaphore was uh, showing a clear, clear way, I would run to the balcony and look what's, what's happening there. And uh, more than often, it, it was a steam train leaving uh, the station to the uh, Rhine River at Bingen. So this was a fantastic place to get spoiled in the first Bingen railways. Next. Oh, yeah, hold on. Yep. <laughs> uh huh. There we go. Yeah. So this Sorry uh, is called Bad Münster am Stein. It's a very difficult name for the um, American or the, the English uh, speaking people. Um, but it's uh, nicely situated, and I couldn't wait. Uh, to take a picture of a steam train myself. This was in 1989 when a three day steam special passed through this uh, town and it was uh, in pouring rain. Actually, I took this picture and I converted it into monochrome because uh, the uh, effect was so profound. And uh, the Nile River, the, the bridge already without the semaphore signals. And, uh, but it was, uh, yeah. I waited for this for this moment to take a picture of a steam train there because my father didn't do it. Um, yeah, so this is one of my uh, fondest memories I have there. Um, yeah, next to the next slide, we go on the opposite slope. This is the view down from a from a viewing point, and uh, it's a spectacular scenery, and you don't see many photos from there. It's uh, it's funny because there are areas with steam. Where there went more rail, but this area was uh, yeah under, under cover, and uh, it has so many vantage points. And this was in 1997 uh, when the Deutsche Bahn ran um, yeah steam specials uh, on a regular basis. And in October they had um, a day or two where they run with the uh, class 44 uh, steam engines, uh, special passenger trains, and I visited my grandparents and uh, took some pictures while I was there. And uh, this is one of my favorites. It has been never published. So this is the first time, except on uh, Facebook, it appears. So this is the, the area where my love for railways and photography really started. And so we will move on to the next photo. Uh, this is actually the, the, the town where I grew up after moving to Baden-Württemberg. This is near Karlsruhe on the private Alptalbahn, basically a light rail uh, operation, but they had uh, steam since the late 1970s. And uh, they ran uh, every last Saturday and Sunday in, in the month, they ran steam specials on the light rail. And uh, passing was a light rail to, to the school in the background, the, the tracks go down. From my uh, hometown, I wrote in my captions here, which I don't use, um, that I it took 10 minutes to go by bike down there and watch the, the, the preparation of, of the steam engines and going up the hill, it took me half an hour. But I spent a lot of time there, took a lot of pictures, and this was in December 1986. Next, please. And um, because of uh, commuted uh, by light rail to the school, I saw stuff happening there. And uh, one day they brought a Pacific from Eastern Germany. Uh, and uh, it was just uh, the, the main run from the overhaul. My father is at the steering wheel, and I got him to chase uh, the uh, the main run in the valley. And uh, yeah, so even on my front door, I uh, had a fantastic steam activity. But uh, nevertheless, uh, in 1986, there was still a regular steam in East Germany. So I uh, talked to my parents. Oh, let 
I want to, to see the, the, the steam engines and uh, let me go there. And they, they have fear I would get arrested and uh, they had to buy me free like uh, the, the, the spies uh, crossing the, the famous bridge in Berlin. Um, yeah, they had their, their visions of me getting arrested while taking pictures of friends. Uh, but in fact, I got to Eastern Germany in 1986. Next, please, Mike. In 1986, I was put together with a friend called Michael as well. He lived in Jena, and uh, our friends that li lived in Jena were uh, at my home for one week. Um, he took me around, uh, and by uh, by bike we went to Gershwitz, where the uh, Class 41 Mikados were maintained. And on the way, we passed and um, yeah, disabled. Uh, tram on the on the way it lost its pantograph and it's uh, only one of a uh, few pictures I actually took of these uh, tramway operations because um, it, I had also the, the the fear of getting caught caught uh, taking pictures of uh, yeah trains and operations that might be strategic and uh, so I uh, concentrated on the steam and uh, kept a low profile otherwise so please next. And uh, at Gershwitz, uh, yeah, this was, um, yeah, it was fantastic. I didn't get much activity there uh, because we, as 16 year old lads, we didn't have uh, much uh, clue. Uh, I had the, the uh, schedules out of the Western Germany magazine and he told me he has the right plans. Uh, neither of our schedules were actually the, the accurate ones. So it was a hit and miss, but uh, we got one nice uh, chance in the afternoon to see the servicing of one class 41 engine and the uh, class 44 in the background was serving um, as a temporary heating pr provision for the uh, power, uh, uh, power plant in the, in the background. So yeah, this was my, my first visit to Eastern Germany and uh, there would uh, come some more. So please next. In 1987, I visited a, a friend of my uh, late uh, grandfather who passed in 1952, but who kept contact to, to a friend in uh, Dresden. So I called home Dresden in the summer of 1987, and I spent one day at Löbo and around. I took always the train to get there. I had no car and uh, took the train, but it's really spectacular to see no other photographers on the bridge. Uh, I was the only one documenting uh, this train here, and uh, yeah, this uh, is really a special kind of feeling uh, to to witness such uh, steam action, and there is no other uh, other one taking pictures. Next, please. And uh, in 1988, I was just about to finish my high school, and uh, amidst learning for the uh, for the high school exam. Uh, I decided to go after steam again, <laughs> and this is one morning run. I uh, ran from the station. I took the train to St. Egidian, and I thought, okay, I'll hike uh, to, to see the viaduct, but it was pretty a long way, and uh, the last resort is uh, to shoot a silhouette against the sun, and uh, worked quite nicely, even with the old scanner from, 19, from 2001. It still looks pretty. Uh, next one. And uh, this was in, in May 1988, after I finished high school, and the next day after I got my degree, I jumped in the train and I uh, documented the last runs in Saxony. And this was about the last day of operation of the Class 86 uh, tank engines in the Lower Saxonia, because um, it was very hot these days and they, uh, they, uh, they had uh, extreme fire danger. So this was, I think, the last day they operated these uh, little tank engines, and I got a nice scene at, at Annaberg with the uh, yeah casual uh, officials sitting on the bench and uh, the semaphore signals and uh, all the junk and the, the toilet on the, on the on the platform. All these uh, neat little details. I love it. Next, please. And uh, but. Also in Western Germany, the, we had uh, steam engines uh, starting with the uh, 150 years, uh, years celebration of uh, railways in Germany. 
the Deutsche Bahn, Deutsche Bundesbahn back then, started to run steam again on a limited basis. And uh, just one day before I entered military service, I visited uh, an event uh, in Upper Bavaria, in, in the Bavaria near uh, Bayreuth on the Schiefe Ebene. Some might know this place. And uh, on the return home to, to Karlsruhe, I um, took this uh, pan shot of the uh, class uh, 01 three cylinder Pacific in uh, full track speed. And uh, yeah, what a way to quit shooting trains and uh, hit the military service. Next, please. And even while in the military service, this was in April 1989, um, I visited Eastern Germany once again. Even if I was in the uh, Western Germany in the, Deutsche, in the the Bundeswehr, I took care that I didn't get any uh, specific uh, security uh, and all this stuff. I told them, frankly, I have contacts to Eastern Germany, so um, I didn't have access to, to uh, to sensible information. So I went to Eastern Germany to shoot steam again. After a week in the Harz Mountains, I uh, visited the festival of 150 years uh, mainline in, uh, in Saxony. And this was as a reason where there were 30,000 people watching the parade of uh, steam engines and modern power as well. And uh, I shared the place with the railroaders. Um, to get the perfect view of the uh, overcrowded platforms and the uh, steam engines uh, passing there. They closed the, the station and the tracks for two hours to, yeah, celebrate. And uh, it was uh, fantastic, fantastic to witness. Next, please. Yeah, and uh, after the, the wall came down, I was finished with the military service. I couldn't wait to, to, to hit the road again. This time by car. I had my own car and not the Trabant. This was at Mügeln where they had the 75, 7, 750 millimeter network, freight only. And they, they had a century old uh, steam engines running on a daily basis. And this was a shot on a Sunday in uh, January 1990. Next. Next month, yeah. And um, yeah, this is where the uh, the Narragate steam engines were maintained. This uh, is the uh, Berlitz shops. And uh, I had the chance to visit it, um, not on an official basis, but I happened to stumble into one who opened the door for me the two days later, we had an appointment and uh, he showed me around and I took a roll of film I exposed there. And it was a fantastic experience because it was a time when uh, things uh, were possible you couldn't dream of. And um, I came around a bit and I visited so many steam sheds and I had a really, I had a blast. I could kind of take off the entire year in 1990, but uh, yeah, time was limited. I had to work to get money to get back there. And um, yeah, it was great. And the atmosphere and the was to really work on a daily basis on steam engines. Um, yeah, next please. And the uh, same month, uh, this is a freshly overhauled uh, steam locomotive, which was built in 1933. Uh, it was the first locomotive to be uh, equipped with the air brakes because they had uh, vacuum brakes formerly and they didn't get parts. So they started to convert them to air brake. And uh, I happened to stumble into a, a maiden run, the only photographer on hand. And I got this uh, nice portrait on, on the, of the uh, fireman, the uh, engine taking water. And um, this was at Dipoldiswalde Dipol near Dresden. The trains still that run there. Um, it's a fantastic line. If you happen to, to be in the area, don't miss it. Next one, Mike. Yeah, back to Western Germany in my home area. It's the line which I documented very well because it's uh, now converted to a light rail and I uh, made good use of uh, spare time to doc document also the uh, steam trains. This was in uh, July 1990 uh, when they uh, transferred the uh, newly overhauled uh, class uh, 01 Pacific to Nuremberg after it ran a few times around my hometown of Karlsruhe and uh, I did a lot of chases there, 
And uh, yeah, it's a rural, rural line which was double tracked uh, until the, I think, 1940s or maybe 50s. Uh, basically, a single track main line um, running from Karlsruhe to Heilbronn and further on to Nuremberg. Um, really nice line, and I uh, love how the, 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 uh, the birds uh, and the, the uh, all the shade and the guy with a beer uh, in the shade on the, uh, on the ramp. Yeah. So these uh, Eisenbahn Romantic, as uh, Mike uh, told me, yeah, why not showing the Eisenbahn Romantic? And yeah, this is Eisenbahn Romantic in Western Germany. Next one. Yeah, back to <laughs> back to the to Eastern Germany, the last weeks of German Democratic Republic, and uh, this was uh, two days ago, thirty years ago. It was on uh, September seventeenth. And this is at the uh, hospital in Saalfeld. They had um, a class of three Pacific as a heating boiler, but it never worked out. Uh, they made a large effort to, to put it up there on the hill and I had the conveyor crossing there. I don't have a picture of the conveyor, but I was told in the test runs in winter, it's cold when you need it and the cold froze on the conveyor belt and they didn't get really properly working. So they had got, they still got the permission to burn the, the precious oil and uh, never made use of it. Uh, parts of this locomotive still uh, exist at the mining. They brought it down, but uh, uh, rebuild uh, never happened. Um, yeah, the uh, parts are still there, but uh, I got a nice September morning. I got to, to see it among other hogs and uh, yeah, had a lot of fun in September. And uh, next one. Okay, that's a fast for, um, for move to February 1991. Uh, one of the greatest plan of events uh, in the German, uh, Eastern Germany. Um, in the morning, uh, our, we drove one hour to take the picture of the double header of class 44. And uh, this is a great rotor and um, yeah, I missed those times. Was well, a fantastic experience. Next, yeah. Then after the the plan in uh, Turinga in 1991, I hit uh, Poland for the first and only time, and um, yeah, it was a time capsule. It was a time machine right there. The weather wasn't so good, um, so this is the, the rural stations. It's like a time machine right to to the 1920s. So uh, black and white is in order to capture this. And um, next one, please. And it uh, got a cab ride on the uh, class 52, um, the World War II era steam engine. And uh, yeah, it was um, also a special trip, but uh, the distance to Poland for me was pretty, pretty long, so I didn't make another visit. But uh, the, the nights, next one please, the nights were, were especially uh, moving there. We sneaked in the, the shade area and uh, took some night pictures. Um, because they had 10, 10 uh, steam locomotives running on a regular basis. They're still in the February. And one by one, they came back to, to be serviced. And uh, yeah, it was a fantastic atmosphere until we got kicked out, but uh, no penalty. I got uh, nice photos and uh, yeah, it was worth it. Next one. And one by one, they entered the roundhouse and uh, yeah, it was uh, yeah, fantastic. And next one. And uh, on the way back, we made a detour to uh, Piwa, called uh, the former town of Schneidemühl, the last one of the last two uh, shops which maintain steam engines. And this is a narrow gauge steam locomotive which is which is just being dis disassembled for a complete overhaul. And uh, they had at least five uh, steam engines under repair and overhaul. And uh, back then they had uh, about one, uh, one a month was, was finished, but this was over by, I think, 1992. Next one. Yeah, but this uh, was a candid shot with my roller with a folding viewer. They didn't notice. I think that the conductor noticed me taking a picture, but the, he didn't uh, look at me. He uh, um, felt he was being photographed, but it was too good to pass. Uh, it's a Freital Heisberg at the platform and uh, the timeless scene, the steam engineer and the fireman, the two conductors of a passenger train. 
Uh, fantastic atmosphere in October 1991. Still Deutsche Reichsbahn. Love it. Next one. Yeah, another plan dump for sunset um, at uh, near Magdeburg. The first Brandoffs were falling. Uh, class 41 steam engine was running in the direction to Berlin. This was also a memorable plan dump. What was it's unbelievable what what was possible on main lines back then uh, 30 years ago. It's uh, unbelievable today what they pulled off. Next one. Yeah, and uh, I was uh, going after a steam train there at the uh, little uh, town station of Nienhagen. But waiting for the steam train, I uh, took a picture of the regular train and uh, left just love the, the interaction between, between the the, uh, the station mistress and the the engineer. His view is uh, yeah, priceless. It's a fantastic image. Taken with a Rolli and the size Jena 180 millimeter, I had custom rebuilt for the roller. Next one. Yeah, chasing steam can, can take me different places. This was a, a hospital train uh, I chased overnight. And uh, this Hulk uh, was transferred to the museum and uh, had a hot axle. But they took the time, uh, poured some more all over it, and resumed the journey. And uh, they made it. Next one. Yeah, kind of farewell. This was one of my uh, last uh, steam trips to Eastern Germany in October 1997. Regular steam. Uh, back then it was Deutsche Bahn. Later it was privatized. Uh, was also you spend a full week shooting steam there, and this is the uh, the signature image from the uh, from the week. It's still running there. If you have the chance uh, until the pandemic, when the pandemic is down, go there. It's uh, fantastic. Next one. So we are leaving uh, Central Europe. I after was tired of uh, steam engines. I heard had the note that uh, there were alcos running in Greece, so I uh, had to visit this place. But because be before I saw an alcohol, this is downtown Athens, and uh, I see trains that uh, built in Germany is uh, crossing the the busy uh, street to Piraeus, and uh, this is uh, Manuel. I got uh, to know. We talked a bit, and uh, he got the, the train a good roll by, and uh, yeah, basic street running there. Next one, yeah, the Alcos. This is a narrow gauge Alco on the Corinthus Canal. I'm standing on a uh, the road bridge with a two lane uh, heavy traffic behind me, and uh, yeah, it's a um, miracle. Sometimes happens the train and the shift uh, travels underneath. Um, it's uh, once in a lifetime chart you can't repeat. Uh, the narrow gauge uh, system is down. Um, you can't repeat this shot. It's uh, in June 1997, after I got my degree in uh, geology, I went to Greece to shoot trains. Uh, I see Mike is uh, not okay. Mike, yeah, thank you. I've traveled uh, by train like I did in the GDR. I traveled exclusively by, by train in Greece. Uh, it, it took me places uh, because they, uh, they had the, the, the possibility to flag trains. You could tell the conductor, oh, stop there. And I got off, and uh, if the train, uh, some flaggable, flag stoppable, stoppable trains, you raise the hand and they stop for you. So this is uh, in the mountain sections, which was were bypassed by the new alignment uh, two years ago. Um, behind them, the NOW built in the 1970s. They were fantastically loud, and uh, I'm thankful for the British fans, which got me hooked on these. these. Next one. Yeah, this is a tiny station of uh, Trachis, uh, over 100 meters above the, 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 the valley, and it's not the, not the valley, but the plains. This is the, the Brados Rail Pass, um, which is also um, yeah, still active, but not with, not with uh, heavy trains, but the DMUs uh, serve for the basic uh, public conveyance there. But this was the, the real, real thing in the summer 1997. Um, international trains, long distance trains, uh, freight, and a uh, fantastic time there. Next one, please. Yeah, this was in uh, 
Actually, this was in uh, January. I took the, the wrong caption, but uh, either way, this was the, the uh, Papadia Bridge on the Bravos Pass. This was the, the holiday traffic after Christmas. They had uh, longer trains and they needed a point helper. And uh, one of my best sound recordings is uh, just this scene with the shepherd on the bridge and uh, the, the scenery, uh, yeah, priceless experience. I took the train, flagged the train down, I walked across, not across the bridge, down the valley, up the hill. Um, yeah, can't repeat it. Next one. Next one, Mike. Oh yeah. Okay. This was the the it was dubbed the least the last the last uh, world locomotive the DL five hundred class of Alco. The last operational. Uh, I was happy to get it in a nice scenery um, in April nineteen uh, ninety eight. And this is was uh, yeah. Also, uh, in fact, uh, the the Greece uh, rail fan, Greek rail fans dubbed this location after me. It's called Stoneville. <laughs> it's funny. Funny anecdote. <laughs> okay, next one. I think we are leaving now. The uh, the uh, this is the farewell picture. Um, the the uh, Bravos Pass, uh, fantastic scenery, and uh, this is the fair, my farewell picture from Greece because we left on the on, on the same night with the organizer to to, uh, to uh, Thessaloniki to fly home, and uh, the next day. Uh, the, the, the uh, alcohol service was about to end. It, uh, I think, went into the summer and the year was done with, with the new power which has arrived. Next one, I think we're going to Portugal now. Yeah, this is uh, the next uh, destination for the alcohol lovers in the late 1990s. This is the uh, Brano's uh, roundhouse. No alcohols here, but uh, you see English electrics, and this uh, roundhouse houses steam until the 1970s. And uh, you could wander around there, and nobody bothered you. Uh, I had a photo permit, but no nobody asked me in the uh, Barrera roundhouse. And uh, this was the, the home basis for the, the alcohols. Next one. And next to the roundhouse, the um, alcohols were maintained in the, in the shops, and this is the, the run through sections. Uh, where one uh, 1948 RSC 2 was maintained, another one uh, behind it, and they were repowered in the 1970s uh, in the early with the 251 engines replacing the uh, tired uh, 244s. And uh, they ran the um, suburban trains, freight trains, uh, fast interregional passenger, passenger trains, and these uh, were the purest enjoyment with a single land horn and uh, fantastic. Next one. Yeah, this is one of the suburban trains uh, heading for Barrero, the, the, the ferry terminal. Um, trains don't run here on a regular basis. The ferry terminal is gone. They have uh, the, the new track alignment going over the Tejo River to directly to, to Lisbon. Um, yeah, back then it was uh, still the old uh, cars from Switzerland and uh, the uh, Alcos. Fantastic. Next one. Yeah, the, the um, commuters leaving the, the, the train and some uh, go right over the tracks. Um, yeah, it's uh, nobody bothers you when you're crossing the tracks at one uh, on the wrong uh, place. And uh, these are the English electrics. And this Pinar Novo station was my favorite hangout. Uh, the next few photos are from there because it's uh, so many vantage points and the uh, 100 plus trains, uh, commuter trains, uh, the, the freight trains, the uh, interregional inter trains. Um, next one. Yeah, the English electrics held, held down the, the uh, uh, express trains from the Algarve coast. And um, they had uh, two or three people on the, on the locomotive. And these are all retired now. Next one. Yeah, in the evening uh, light, it was uh, my favorite light. Um, the old houses, uh, semaphore signals, uh, code line. Uh, it was so nice a station to take pictures. It's completely modernized now. Um, I've never been there since. I don't. I like to remember it as as it is. It's still, still uh, the, the water spout, the water column to for the steam engines. It's, it was back then still uh, the steam era. Steam era. Next one. 
And uh, yeah, the, I love Bauhaus ar architecture, and this is one of possibly three Bauhaus uh, the towers that are still in existence in, in uh, Portugal. Um, and the signal bridge for the uh, upper quadrant signals. And this is a, a unit uh, train to the, uh, the car plants nearby. And uh, yeah, the spotless alcohols. Next one. And a close up on the signal bridge for the uh, NOAA um, rail car built in 1948, crowded with people. Um, they made a lowly passenger service around uh, this, this area. And uh, yeah, pretty well maintained uh, stock and, and uh, motive power. Um, pure, pure joy there to photograph in this, uh, in this time. Next one. And a farewell shot from Pinal Novo, a light, uh, light engine movement uh, of a DL535. Built in Spain under license. Um, uh, same uh, type is uh, running in Argentina and I uh, think in Australia. Uh, yeah, also one of the worldwide uh, applications of Alcapau. Next one. Yeah, I traveled the uh, 1996, uh, I traveled uh, most of the country except the narrow gauge sections. This is on the Algarve coast at uh, Lagos. Um, the train running to the dunes uh, near the beaches. I have to speed up a bit. <laughs> Next one. And I didn't want to miss out on the uh, mountain sectors. And uh, on my way back uh, to the uh, central, uh, I passed through Bisha. And um, yeah, these rural stations were beautiful with the uh, semaphores with no, with no lights and uh, code lines again with the levers on the, on the platform and uh, old Renault car. It was uh, so nice, and I enjoyed putting this uh, presentation together. Next one. And uh, yeah, from reference, often uh, not not well documented is the Vinata uh, Baira Baixa uh, in central Portugal. And they had the um, uh, assignment of the MLW MX620. And uh, they had 70 car uh, but stainless steel trains going up the hill. and. Uh, it's amazing how the 200, 2,000 horsepower uh, lightweight engines made the mountains, uh, but uh, they did it. But they were retired a few years ago, and uh, the line is electrified now, and uh, yeah, a different place. Next one. And uh, yeah, no trip to Portugal is complete with the visit of the Lisbon trams. And uh, this was in December 1997, uh, yeah. And uh, the light in winter is so fantastic. The, the low sun uh, and the, the nearby uh, sea and the, the, the Tejo River provides a fantastic light there. And uh, it's uh, really for every photographer loving good light and every artist is the place to be in winter time. And this is on the, um, near the, the old uh, Ribeira Mercado and um, market hall from the uh, 1880s. Beautifully, a neat place to eat now, and we uh, yeah, have fantastic scene to shoot the trams. Next one, yeah, this is uh, in the the old Alfama quarter, uh, line uh, twenty eight, uh, curving up the the, the hill. Um, I'm standing on the stairs of the medieval cathedral from the eleventh century, and this is um, a baroque uh, church we are looking for on the real part. Um, from the uh, 17th century. Next one. And I think this is my closing photo. This is the, the uh, downtown section of the Lisbon uh, Line 28. And uh, this was about the last trip I made with analog equipment. So this is my farewell. Um, it was all shot on analog and all, all digitized and um, Thank you for the attention and uh, had really fun putting this together and I hope you had fun too. And I'm handing this over to Michael Ross Valentine. Mike, your turn. Great photos, Ralph. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed uh, seeing this. 
So uh, good afternoon uh, and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, thank you, Vaughn, Scott, Haley, and the center. It's wonderful uh, to see how the center is progressing uh, with things. Uh, my involvement with the center over the years has been very rewarding, and it's very great to see how well the center is doing. So again, uh, just a quick thanks for everybody. Um, <clears throat> so now we go to the president. And uh, the good news is that uh, Europe's still a very fascinating, very diverse place uh, to go see trains. I moved back to Europe uh, last year after 23 years, uh, and it's still very interesting. Uh, my portion of the program is about recent, recent experiences in photography work over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, as well as some travel ideas uh, for those of you who haven't been here or just, um, just some ideas about some things, so. Uh, let's see here. So one of the things, just real quick, um, Europe, a lot of people have a misconception, particularly Americans, that Europe's small, and in reality, it's actually uh, huge, and it's very dense. Um, it extends basically the equivalent of going from Hudson Bay down to Florida, and France is as big as Texas, so there's a lot of, a lot of stuff going on here. I mentioned this because the mistake is a lot of times uh, people try to see too many places in kind of a short period of time. So it's kind of a good idea, I think, to, to pick some things that you want to see and just enjoy them and kind of stay in that area. That's just my view. Um, again, this isn't an all-encompassing program of Europe. It's just um, some of the stuff I've done. And uh, there's lots of experience here. So... I guess if I had to use a single word to describe Europe, it would be diverse. It's an incredibly diverse continent, geographically, culturally, historically, operations-wise. It's very, very different from country to country, and that's what I find particularly uh, interesting about it. Um, and you're probably wondering why am I starting with a photo taken in Poland in May of 2002. The reason why is, is believe it or not, you can take this photo today. There's still regularly scheduled standard gauge steam running here. Maybe the coaches are different, but you could have taken the same photo this afternoon, ironically. So that's one of the cool things. So if we start way in the north, here's just some quick photos. This is um, at 60 degrees latitude north in uh, Norway in June, uh, we're going up the Bergen Railway. And if you take a look at the photo in the lower left, you can actually see how steep the grade is. Um, this is a fascinating landscape, but it kind of gives you an idea just what a contrast Europe is between what we saw in Poland and up here where you're in basically Arctic conditions. So and there is a standard gauge railway in Norway that actually crosses the Arctic Circle. Um, one of the biggest stories probably in Europe, or, or I would say basically with Europe when we're talking about railroading, really passenger railroading here plays a massive, massive role. Um, High-speed rail has been around now for about four decades, but it's evolved great to the countries. And they have their own interest from a photography standpoint and certainly to ride them. And it's very interesting because a lot of these, uh, pass, a lot of these, high-speed trains going to classic old terminals. So you see a real interesting contrast between the two. Here we are in, in Paris, France. One of the other things about passenger rail that's interesting in, in Europe is there's a very big movement right now and a lot of investment happening. Um, politics plays a big role in it. Uh, there's a very big push towards carbon neutrality. There's a lot of green parties in Europe, but that's very beneficial for rail fanning uh, because of the investment. And another really cool thing that's happening is that the night trains, uh, which were kind of given up for the dead because of high speed trains, they've actually making a comeback. So that's some of the interesting stuff that's happening. And if you take a look here, if we start from right to left, um, I should say what you have is, is you have an Austrian railjet train uh, going through the Alps. And in the center, you have uh, an Italian passenger train along the Adriatic coast in Trieste, Italy. And then what you also have here is a train in Spain. 
So you get a lot of different diversity, even in the mountains and in the oceans and in the uh, types of trains. So a lot of the railroading is very urban and very dense. Uh, as you can take a look here, you can see that there's multiple main tracks. This is coming into the main station into Venice, Italy, and it's pretty fascinating because the amount of trains here is virtually nonstop. Literally every few minutes a train is coming or, or going. One of the things I really personally like uh, is I like the classic inner city passenger trains, and there's still a lot of these running in different places. This here is a uh, inner city train running between Munich, Germany and Venice, Italy. And this is just across the border from Austria and into Italy. Literally the mountain ridge in the background divides Italy and Austria. So this is a very, very beautiful part of the world. Fortunately, it's not too far from where I live. This is about 40 minutes away. This is another personal favorite train of mine. This is the uh, Transalpine, the uh, Euro City train that runs between Zurich, Switzerland, and Graz, Austria. And it has a panorama car, um, which is really nice. And you can see it here crossing through the Alps. And passenger trains aren't always fast express trains. A lot of times they're local trains running and going from stop to stop. And in this case here, this is a Ration railway train uh, crossing over into, um, well, it's going over the Burning Glacier and running towards uh, the Italian border. Another interesting train, this is actually uh, is, um, this train here is a actual carted passenger train. So Ralph was talking about some of the steam that still exists. What's fascinating, a lot of these trains, they're not run by the National Railway, but they've been privatized, but they're still running as daily passenger trains. This is a very early in the morning train that uh, is set up for school children to go to school every day. And another thing too, is not only just regular passenger trains, but there's a fascinating amount of uh, streetcars and extensive networks. This here happens to be in Vienna. And another place that's really interesting is in Milan, Italy. Uh, these are the uh, Peter Witt street cars that still run. I highly recommend uh, Milan, Lisbon, Vienna, Prague if you're into uh, traction. Another thing never to be overlooked uh, when you're in Europe is to still take advantage of the dining cars that are still running, uh, which is really a nice thing. Uh, right now, still there's still a lot of dining cars running, but the Czech Republic actually still has onboard chefs that make uh, meals served on Railway China. And it's a pretty, pretty cool experience if you get a chance. This is kind of funny. This is on the Transalpine train. Kind of something I do from where I live is I actually get on this train occasionally because I have a pass for the province that I live in. I get in and have lunch, go out to one town, ride it for an hour, have lunch, and then come back the other direction and have dessert. So um, it's one of the unique experiences. Another thing is uh, moving goods. So not only is there a lot of rail passenger traffic, but there's also certainly a tremendous amount of freight that moves in Europe, but it highly depends on uh, the country that you're in. So Germany, Switzerland, Austria, Northern Italy, uh, part to the east have a lot more goods traffic than others do. This is also in the same valley. Uh, I've been concentrating, taking a lot of photos here because they're building a new 64 kilometer long rail tunnel that'll be the longest tunnel in the world that will bypass this. The line won't get ripped up, but it just won't have as much traffic. Currently, there's about 150 trains a day on this, uh, mostly freight. And then there's, you know, the, the beautiful parts of the Alps. So in this case here, this is the line from uh, Switzerland going to Austria and to the east. Uh, this is uh, in a place called Pions where it crosses over uh, a 300 meter bridge and uh, uh, rolls past an older medieval castle. So there's some really wonderful areas uh, to go check out. One of the biggest things that's probably changed since I moved here is uh, open access has happened in the EU. So basically what that means is that the national railways of each country are not the exclusive operator. So you get a lot of freight traffic that's operated by private carriers and other railroads. 
So this is pretty neat to, uh, to see these two pictures here uh, over on the left were taken minutes apart actually uh, following each other. Um, then up in the upper corner, you have a, uh, an Italian engine, so stuff like that. And then there's also a lot of special livery locomotives. This was in uh, Hungary and it was dedicated to the uh, composer uh, Wagner. So there's a lot of neat stuff variety wise now running the rails that's worth checking out. Another interesting thing is going local. Uh, one thing that kind of surprised me moving back is there's still staff country stations uh, serving people uh, with old interlocking. A lot of the stuff's being updated and modernized, but it still exists. And uh, it's pretty fascinating to see. Uh, one thing here, <laughs> I kind of joke about this as being precision scheduled railroading Austrian style. They schedule the trains down to the minute so the passenger train comes. And then right after that, you have the local goods train uh, switching out lumber cars, doing single car load, loose car railroading. So there's still some big variety once you get away from the main line to interesting stuff to observe. Another thing that's really interesting to view is uh, the railway architecture across Europe. It varies a lot by culture and country. There's a lot of old architecture, a lot of new architecture. Um, but one thing in Europe that they're really good at is, is preserving uh, architecture and preserving things. And so there's a lot of great railway structures still in existence. So this here was a station in Leuven, Belgium. And here we have the grand entrance to a station in Barcelona, Spain. And this is the hall of the same station where they have a classic train shed. Now what's interesting is even though we have these classic things, how, how does this fit into modern architecture? And the answer to that is actually right here. This is a new train shed that was built in Portugal in the 90s. And I, I think it's a wonderful interpretation of, of taking modern design and uh, bringing them in, into, the, into the period. So it's, it's really interesting to observe not just the old stuff, but the new stuff. And so I think this one in Portugal has some really interesting modern architecture. Um, kind of taking that to a upper extreme, which really is interesting, is uh, what happened in Vienna. The Vienna, because of the war and different things, they never had a, a true proper main station. So they just, in the past few years, rebuilt a very new, very modern train station that's covered. Uh, but it's interesting to see uh, the modern architecture and how that played out. So you can see here the new train sheds and some modern rail jets coming and going. And you can see the platforms in the sheds. So it's uh, it's really interesting. Uh, so it's not just the old stuff. There's a lot of new stuff. And basically from country to country, it's just fascinating uh, the different styles of architecture, both old and new. So one thing that <laughs> that's a little fun is, is basically rail fanning in Europe can be very different uh, experience in Europe. A lot of times it's you're spending less time in the car, you're spending a lot more time on the train and you're not, it's not confined to being a, a singular activity, I guess. Uh, you're out and about. One of my favorite things in Europe actually is there's a lot of great trackside restaurants uh, that you can go to right next to the train tracks on the platform and have a full meal. Uh, one other thing I would also recommend if you're ever in Italy is always get the coffee in an Italian train station. Uh, it's, it's incredible. So the other thing that's uh, a lot more different and here we have Scott uh, who came to visit and he and I both rode in uh, Switzerland together is we don't have in Europe quite as strict of liability laws. Uh, so you can do a lot of a lot more things over there. Things are a little more relaxed, a little more laid back. You can Dutch door. You can, if the trains still have open coaches, you can open the windows and stick your head out. And uh, that's one of the really fun experiences on a beautiful summer day to go and uh, go Dutch dooring and riding on trains. Uh, over here on the right, we uh, we're riding a uh, 
German narrow gauge train. They had an open gun that you could ride on. And it's just a wonderful experience. Um, it's kind of interesting what Ralph showed was this town in Portugal. This is the same place actually. Um, and now they have tourist trains running there that are kind of fun to ride. This is my wife and daughter. Uh, and they had different musical performers on the train and uh, it's just a really wonderful experience. So there's a lot of nostalgia trains running and a lot of things like that too. And those shouldn't be overlooked because they're really fun experiences that you can do with the family. Another really, really cool thing, uh, in my opinion, really neat experience is a lot of the modern locomotives in Europe and different places. Uh, it's possible to get an engineer's view while you're riding. So over here on the left, uh, I'm riding, looking at the engineer's view of a uh, German inner city express train, looking out the front view and over here on the right, this is on the Ration Railway as we're crossing uh, over into burning a path. So this is really kind of a neat experience. You're behind glass, but you still, you know, can experience the effect of, of an engineer's or a driver's view uh, while you're running. So one thing that's kind of different is because people are used to being around railroads in Europe, um, things are a lot more hands-on. Uh, they're a lot more laid back and you don't have as tight a security. This was a steam excursion that I was on in Switzerland with Scott actually in February and I was kind of astonished they needed to turn the locomotive and the passengers on the train actually got off and were uh, volunteered to help turn the locomotive. Uh, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, in some countries or back in the US, they would have had security fencing and security people and they'd have been yelling at people. But um, this is uh, really kind of a neat thing. So another really interesting, fun thing to do if you get a chance is there's actually a train where you can load your car on the train and put it through a tunnel uh, in Slovenia. It's the best 13 euros you'll ever spend and you can uh, have a nice experience being pulled by EMD diesels. This is also something that's kind of diverse and very unique and a lot of fun. So one of the concepts I was talking to Ralph about was two words that really don't exist in the English language. One is uh, Altag or Eisenbahn Altag and that means things that happen in everyday life that aren't that are just normal at the time. They're unremarkable, but they're kind of neat to look at. So over on the left, we have the crew of the steam train uh, waiting while the crew relaxes on a bench. Over on the right, we have some kids uh, going past the railway tracks, riding their bike while the crew ties up uh, for the evening. This is probably one of my favorite photos that I've taken in a long time. I thought this was kind of neat. This is generations passing, you have a young woman getting on the train while an older woman exits the train. Um, life can be in front of you if you pay attention to it. So these are also in Slovenia. These are at the shops in Ljubljana. Uh, these are the shop workers posing with a picture of Tito. And uh, here we have the guy at the station giving the order that the train can depart. It's also worth noting some of the heritage railways in England, particularly in England, but also in Germany are really fascinating, great opportunities for photography and just really a true time capsule to experience um, and really, really wonderful. This was the locomotive driver at the uh, Loughborough Shed on the Great Central Railway. This was at night uh, at Grossmont, a steam dinner train departing. Uh, it's hard to believe when you look at these photos that these were actually taken in, in the year 20, 2019 and 2020. Another kind of interesting word that exists in the German language is Eisenbahn romantic or romantica. And that's a concept of of how the railroad can actually be a romantic or a beautiful thing. And sometimes these can be an empty, lonely, or nostalgic feeling like this. 
empty platform in uh, England at Hellefield South Junction. Kind of abandoned and forlorn, but also romantic in a nice way. And here we have the uh, poppy fields blooming in uh, Rottable, Germany. And if we get down to a closer to the ground look, it's uh, pretty remarkable. So, Rolf and I thank you. Uh, the clocks indicate, and these are all station clocks, that our time is up. So if anybody has any questions, uh, we'd be happy to take them. Well, Mike and Rolf, thank you both so much for a fascinating look at the, the interesting and varied railways of Europe through the years. Um, since we are running a little bit over time, we're going to go right into the next pre presentation. We'll shorten up the break.